Are we alone? Is there a place with life other than Earth? It's a question we've all probably asked ourselves, or at least thought about at one point or another. It's a powerful question. It's a complicated question. How do we even begin to answer it? First, we need to understand what we need to support life anywhere, even here on Earth. First, we need energy, something to propagate a reaction. We need liquid water to facilitate that reaction. And we need organics that can react together. And without these three ingredients, we can't support life. And if we look at our own solar system, we know there's no other planet like Earth. Let's start with the inner planets at Venus, where the surface temperature averages over 460 degrees Celsius, so hot that not only is there no liquid water, but solid lead would melt in your hand. Next is Mars, which is a little tricky. We know there's water, but it's frozen at the poles. And while the surface temperature at the equator can get up to 25 degrees Celsius, with such a thin atmosphere, the temperature drops below zero to negative 70 at night. And if we go any further past Mars, it's too cold. Even at Jupiter, the next closest planet, the surface temperature is well below zero, 130 degrees Celsius, colder than dry ice. So it's pretty clear. Life can exist on the surface of our solar system. Maybe George Lucas was right. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, there were Jedi Knights fighting off Imperial forces or Pandora's just out of sight. And one day, we'll connect with the Navi people. But we don't want to wait. We want to find life now. But we just looked at our own solar system. We know there's no life on the surface. So what if we took a closer look? What if we took a look beneath the surface? About 500 million miles away is a very unique place, first discovered by Galileo over 400 years ago. Completing its orbit around Jupiter every three and a half days is one of its smallest moons, Europa. And the surface of Europa is cold, 130 degrees below zero. But as you keep going deeper and deeper, it begins to get warmer and warmer. So warm, in fact, that at some depth, that ice turns to liquid water. And we know this from the Voyager and Galileo spacecraft that have flown by. And we also know Europa's surface is active. It has ridges and valleys, icebergs and cracks all along the surface. And these surface features didn't just appear out of nowhere. Something must be driving them, like maybe an ocean just beneath the surface of the ice. It took scientists 400 years to narrow down the field, but they found it, a place that might have life outside of Earth. Let's go, let's start exploring. After all, we've had astronauts play golf on the moon and there are rovers on Mars right now sending data back to Earth. So there must be something, a machine, a vehicle, something that we can send to Europa. But sadly, there isn't. Let's take a look at what we need for the whole process. First, we need a launch vehicle, something that can lift off from Earth. Then we have to wait six years because it takes a little time to travel 500 million miles. And once we get there, we have to slow ourselves down from 30 miles per second to zero, softly landing on the surface. And once we're there, we still have another roadblock, a sheet of ice that could be anywhere from 10 to 30 miles thick. And once through the ice, the vehicle will have to make decisions on its own because it takes almost two hours to send and receive a response to something that far away. Whatever we send to Europa must be as smart as one of us and it will need to be able to make decisions on its own. Clearly, this is no easy task. We don't have all of these tools yet. Fortunately for us, there are a few places here on Earth that are covered with ice year round. So we have a perfect test platform, but we still need a vehicle. So surely there must be something to study the ice caps here on Earth. But again, we came up empty. It turns out we've sent more vehicles to Mars than there are vehicles to study our own ice shelves here on Earth. So as engineers and scientists, 
We weren't gonna let that get in our way. Presenting Icefin, our very own under ice explorer. One of the hardest things when working on an ice shelf is drilling a hole through hundreds of meters of ice. And most hot water drills can only drill a hole 30 to 40 centimeters in diameter, which is large enough to lower an ocean mooring or a camera, but that only gives us data in one plane. Icefin, at 24 centimeters in diameter, can't fit through any hole in the ice, but it also gives us data in the vertical and horizontal planes, making it a unique creation. It's also outfitted with a three and a half millimeter fiber optic Kevlar jacketed cable, which serves two functions. First, it's used as communications to send data back and forth instantly. Unlike most autonomous underwater vehicles where data is downloaded after a mission, we can see it instantly, allowing us to stop, examine an interesting feature, and continue our search. And it's also used to lower the vehicle in and out of the water. And if we take a closer look, we'd see it's broken down into seven individual modules, each with a specific purpose. In its most basic form, you need five core modules, three thruster modules to control five degrees of freedom, a navigation module, and a control module, or as I call it, the brains. And with these five modules, you can take Icefin anywhere, but they don't tell you anything. There's no sensors, there's no cameras. It's like driving your car with a blindfold on. And if we tried to fit all of our sensors into Icefin, it would be over five meters long, longer than these tables. So rather than putting them on all at once, we grouped them into modules. Currently installed, we have our survey module. Installed our sonars and cameras that allow us to characterize our environment at a bird's eye view. And once we've completed a mission, we'll remove the survey module and install our ocean chemistry module and we can go investigate an interesting feature further. And this modularity also allows us to develop new modules without having to change the design of an entire vehicle. But more importantly, it allows us to take Icefin to some of the most remote places in the world. Fortunately for me, I was able to take part in two of Icefin's firsts. I was able to be part of a design team that brainstormed and built this incredible vehicle. But I also got to be part of a field team for its first season in Antarctica in 2014. The first question I always get from people is, isn't it cold down there? <laughs> it's hard to describe what it's like working in Antarctica, but I just checked the weather and it's a balmy 27 degrees below zero. So yes, it's a little cold, but we're well cared for with Big Red as it's known to keep us warm. Antarctica is an amazing place mountain ranges for miles, the occasional visit from our seal friend Steve, and even time to eat a slice of ice cold pizza. But all jokes aside, it's an incredible place for its environment above the surface, but even more interesting below the ice. Until our mission in 2014, there were only a handful of vehicles that had been able to take a peek under the surface. They could only dive a few hundred meters and only search a small area. But some of these vehicles made incredible discoveries, like Skinny in 2012, that captured these images of sea anemone that buried themselves in the ice shelf under the ice. So our goal in 2014 was simple. Get to the bottom of the ocean floor and tell us what else was down there. At 500 meters, one doesn't expect to find much. There's no visible light from the surface. So any organism that relies on light to survive can't. And the pressure is over 700 PSI, an incredible amount of pressure that would crush almost every living thing on our surface. But when we got to the bottom of our drill site on the McMurdo ice shelf, we were wrong. When we turned on our cameras and lights, we were amazed at the amount of life we saw. There were sea slugs and brittle stars, even small fish swimming around. There was plant life flourishing and small ice crystals that would eventually detach from the ocean floor to join the ice shelf above. In 2014, Icefin was the first vehicle 
to capture these images and this data under the McMurdo ice shelf of the ocean floor. And it began to answer so many questions that people started asking years ago. But it also prompted new ones. What else is down there? Where is it getting this energy? What else lies below? And that's what our group's been working on since. Last year, NASA continued our funding to keep exploring this unknown world below, venturing even further into the ice shelf, over 400 miles away from the front of the ice. We've started outfitting IceFin with chemical sensors to detect geologic traces in the water that could lead us to the energy and the organics that might be keeping these organisms alive. And we've also started working on sampling mechanisms that could take a water sample right in the middle of a black smoker on the ocean floor, or tell us how a tiny sea anemone has buried itself in the ice shelf. IceFin is one of the most promising tools we have available today to, to explore life under the ice. We've collected encouraging results under the Ross ice shelf, furthering the hope to find life on Europa. And who knows, maybe we'll catch a glimpse of what Earth was like billions of years ago, or there's a giant sea squid just waiting for our arrival. Whether or not there's life on Europa remains to be seen. But today, with the help of IceFin, we're several steps closer to answering that question. Thank you.